Welcome to this episode of Brain Ponderings. Uh, the topic is neuroscience and criminal law, or so-called neuro law. My guest is someone who has a law degree, and he's a clinical psychologist, and he's got involved in issues surrounding, surrounding the potential and prom the promises, and then actually the reality of what can be delivered from basic neuroscience research and the law and the various aspects of law. And we'll get into that. But he's the Ferdinand Wakeman Hubble Professor of Law, Professor of Psychology and Law at Penn Law School. And if I got this right from his website, he's Associate Director of the Center for Neuroscience and Society. I had a Stephen Morse uh, welcome. Thank you very much. I had a previous podcast, I think it's been more than a year ago, with who I assume is one of your colleagues up there, Michael Platt. Who, Maybe, I don't know him. Oh, he, he does a lot of work on decision making and the role of the prefrontal cortex in decision making. And that obviously comes into law where uh, bad decisions are made and it can have consequences. And Okay, so you... You you were up in Boston area. You your undergraduate. You went to Tufts, then you went to Harvard Law School. But you didn't do as a lot of these people do. They become millionaires. No, alas. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about you know your how your your what how this progressed to where you are now? Yeah. Well, I'm an old guy. And I was in school in the 60s, and we thought we were going to change the world. And I started with law, uh, but quickly realized that I was always interested in the same thing, what I called the human law package as opposed to the money law package. Uh, I was interested in crime, crazies, and kids right from the beginning. And it struck me almost immediately in law school that law was a very blunt instrument that didn't help people prevent themselves from getting into trouble. And once they got into trouble, it beat them over the head as opposed to help them undo the problems. And so I decided I needed to know more about human behavior if I was gonna fix the world. So I went and got a very empirical, very bench science psychology degree. But at the same time, I was interested in clinical work. So I got clinical training as well. And then the question was, was I going to be a psychologist who worked on issues of interest to lawyers and do studies that might take three years and then would have no effect in the real world? Or was I going to use my empirical training as a law professor to consume psychology and psychiatry and try to do public policy from that direction? And so I went off to the University of Southern California as a law professor and I've been a law professor ever since, uh, working on the same issues, crime crazies and kids, with special emphasis on issues of personal responsibility and the like. And the way I got into neuro law, which wasn't a field at all, was I've been doing criminal law and mental health law, interdisciplinary stuff with psychiatry, psychology, and the like. And I got invited to a conference uh, the annual meeting of the American Neuropsychiatric Association, the psychiatrists who consider themselves brain jocks. And the plenary session was devoted to a New York City businessman who had a pseudonym then, Spider Sistkoff, who in fact had, he was a 62-year-old successful retired businessman who got into a argument with his wife. I won't go into the details, but uh, she ended up scratching at his face, drawing blood. He punched her once, and he never had been physical with anyone in his entire life, not even adolescent pushing and shoving. And he knocked her to the ground, and he got on top of her. He put his hands around her throat, strangled her to death, and threw her out their midtown Manhattan 12-story window. Needless to say, the New York City Police Department and the Manhattan DA took a very dim view of such behavior. It's not nice and they charged him with murder. Well, rich guy, he was worked up, but just to see if there was anything doing. And finally, a neuropsychologist noticed something very interesting. Even though he was a righty on hand-eye things, he was better with his left hand. So they, they did a scan, 
and it turned out he had a huge subarachnoid cyst. Uh, for those of you who don't know your brain anatomy or the skull anatomy, this is the middle lot, layer that lines the brain. And this was growing on the underside of that layer. It's a huge thing. If you see the uh, MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging structural scan, it's really astonishing how much of his brain was displaced by this. Now, this is a cyst. It's not a tumor. It's not metastatic or anything of the sort. And it was pressing on his left frontal cortex. And so the defense immediately ginned up an insanity defense saying, because of this cyst, he couldn't control himself, which counted as an excusing condition in New York State at the time. Well, in the event, he pled guilty the night before the trial, so there was never any legal decision, except in a preliminary hearing, the judge said, well, I'm going to let in the scan and let the, uh, and let the people talk, let the fence talk about it. Uh, uh, but ultimately, he pled guilty to a lesser form of homicide, manslaughter, not murder, and he was sentenced to prison. He went to prison, and he was, by the way, much as he had been a model citizen until he killed his wife, he was an absolutely model prisoner. And then when he got out of prison, he was a model citizen again and died in his bed at home. So that, that got neuro law started, that case, because everyone said, see, his brain made him do it, which I thought was false from the very get-go. I thought there was a much better psychological explanation than a brain-based or neurological explanation. And I wrote what I think is still now the first let me call it modern or contemporary neuro law article called Brain and Blame, which appeared in one form in a psychiatric journal and in another form in a law review. And for, I mean, how they picked me to be one of the commentators at that plenary session, I have no idea. What they told me was, well, we wanted a legal expert. They had the experts from the case. They had the lawyers from the case. They had all sorts of people, but they wanted a, a, an academic legal expert, and there was no one. And so they <laughs> said, look, you do mental health law, why don't you do this? And I said, okay, but you know, I know more about the brain than the layperson, but not a whole lot. That's not what I do. They said, well, you have six months to learn it. And I discovered <laughs> I learned it in six minutes because the amount of neuroscience that was directly relevant to this case was either primitive or non-existent. So the next thing you know, I was a founder of the field of neural law, which started really about the year 2000, because as you well know, that's when the functional magnetic resonance imaging scanners finally came online for non-clinical work in academic departments of psychology, cognitive science, neuroscience, and the like. And you saw, as you again well know, an exponential growth in behavioral neuroscience for those not familiar, behavioral neuroscience refers to not the neuroscience at the cellular level or subcellular cellular level, but behavioral is affective, cognitive, and social neuroscience, which obviously, since the law is concerned with behavior, would be the more relevant neuroscience. And there was an exponential number of studies of behavioral neuroscience, mostly done on college students, I would say, but there it was. And all of a sudden, the lawyers who were very good at picking up on any trick that might help them, uh, academic lawyers, uh, picked it up and it was going to change everything. You know, we now can look under the hood, quote unquote, so now we'll understand the roots of human behavior at the neural level, and that's going to change law. And I've been, there are three camps in neural law. One of the other skeptics who say, it's a category mistake to think you can learn about human responsibility and human behavior from a purely mechanistic science. It just can't do it. Then there are those who say it's going to change everything. I'm in the middle camp, which is probably the smallest, which says, well, yes, there are things we can learn, but not, they would be legally helpful, although not much, not yet, uh, but it's not going to ultimately transform the law in any way. And then the next major step was 2002 or three, a case of a guy who I named Mr. Oft. Uh, and that's the thing that probably in my academic contributions has most stuck 
that people cite most is my nickname for this guy, because we don't know his, his real last name. Uh, this was a case study from a neurology journal uh, of a guy who had no prior medical or uh, legal history to speak of, a uh, good family man, and he ended up uh, in a second marriage uh, of the wife's second marriage. Uh, she had a 12 year old uh, prepubescent stepdaughter, and he started at some point to develop an interest in child pornography. He was downloading it nonstop, and he was going to massage parlors, not for massage. And he started to molest the stepdaughter. And it was always when the mother is outside the home. Well, the stepdaughter finally mentioned it to her school guidance counselor. School guidance counselor called the mother. The mother hacked the husband's computer and found the child porn, called the cops. He was arrested, taken from the home, and charged with basically child molestation, which is a very serious felony. I won't go into all the details, but it turned out he was suffering from a right orbital frontal cyst. And it was an hemangiopericytoma, which is a very fast growing uh, metastatic, but not non metastatic tumor of the blood vessels. And it's in a, spa a place right here, right above the supraorbital ridge, where there's a higher risk associated with antisocial behavior, although it's not a spot for antisocial behavior. Most people who have lesions or injuries up there uh, do not engage in antisocial behavior, but it is a risk factor. So <clears throat> it turned out that when they discovered this tumor, it needed to be resected immediately. And it was, and immediately his neurological symptoms went away. And in fact, he said he was no longer interested in child pornography. So the judge sent him to a treatment program for people with sexual disorders. And he came through with flying colors. He had failed once previously. And he was looking at jail time because he had failed it. But now the judge said, let's try again. Flying colors, he goes home. Eight months later, he's got headache again. He's got interest in child, children again. And he also had the tumor again. They resected again and all was well. So everyone said, here's the case that really does prove it. His brain made him do it. At which point I start pointing out immediately, look, let's concede he wouldn't have had these desires but for the tumor. But no one's, no one's accusing him of a crime for having untoward desires. There's nothing wrong with desiring to kill people, to rape people, to touch children, to do whatever. It's only a crime if you act on it. And the question was, was he a responsible agent when he molested his stepdaughter? Notice at the time he was going to school and working. He was at home with mom. No one noticed anything. Hmm. In fact, if the stepdaughter had never hmm. reported him he might have just died from the tumor. And who would know? In any case, that's what really got neuro law going. And then in the first case with uh, the man in New York that killed his wife, strangled his wife, and there was a cyst. What, in that case, there was no surgical intervention or anything to remove the cyst and see if his behavior, because that it does suggest if you remove the structural problem, and then the behavior goes back to normal, that's getting a cause effect. Otherwise, it's just an association and no cause and effect. He, uh, these cysts, subarachnoid cysts, are most often congenital. They are not associated with antisocial conduct. And he was offered to have the cyst aspirated. In other words, they insert into the cyst a, a, a very thin needle and then suck the fluid out. Uh, and every neurologist he consulted about this said, don't do it. It'll be more dangerous than leaving it where it is. Because notice, he was 62 years old and nothing had ever happened previously. So a lot of the people who wanted to say, this is a, the brain's the explanation, they would use the analogy of pressing down very lightly on a light switch, but just keep pressing. Finally, you flip the switch. So it had been pressing on his brain and finally the, flip was, uh, the switch was flipped. But... The problem with that is you'd expect him then to have other episodes of discontrol after, and he never did, not for another whatever it was, 
15, 16 years that he lived. So, in yeah. fact, his, his adult daughter, Barbara, I mean, his real name, by the way, is Herbert Weinstein. This has all come out. Uh, his adult daughter, Barbara, firmly believes it was his brain that made him do it, the cyst. And I've been arguing with her very civilly uh, by email for years now. And I say, no, what was going on was this was a guy who was so always cheerful and non-threatening and non-violent. Yeah. He must have had a really you know, thick defensive structure psychologically. But when his wife finally attacked him physically, first time in his life, it broke through and he lost it. And well, that was like an impulsive type behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. And so that's makes sense what the final decision was on manslaughter rather than murder. That seems like a reasonable. Yeah. No story. one uses the case anymore, though, because for exactly the reason I just suggested, it's not interesting. It, it, it's so clear he's guilty. Yeah. Uh, so when you try to do sort of mock trials to, to look at what it looked like, it's not interesting. Whereas Mr. Oft, that gets people's juices flowing. Because yeah. there, we know it did play a causal role because of the time series sequence. Yeah. Uh, but then, again, you know, the, the, the decision on whether to uh, you get to sentencing, right? The, whether they did, in these cases, whether or not they committed the crime was indisputable, my understanding. Right. But then the question you get to sentencing in terms of their responsibility, state of mind, neuropathology, and, you know, what's the probability that they're going to, you know, commit another crime? And, yeah, this gets kind of hairy. But Well, you, you've raised an extremely important issue. On the one hand, there's the question of responsibility. And let's just look at when he molested his stepdaughter. As I said, we don't have a whole lot of data about then. So what I'm about to say is very provisional. Okay. But he's gone to school and none of his co-workers notice anything's amiss. His wife doesn't know that anything's amiss. Clearly, he had a, a lot of rational capacity. And he said to his doctors who reported this case, I knew I shouldn't do it, but the pleasure principle got the best of me. Well, sounds like any old pedophile. Yeah. Whether the pedophilia was caused by a tumor or child rearing or the alignment of the planets it sort of doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so let's assume for a moment he's responsible. But given the history since, he's not in much danger because now he knows what the problem is and he now knows to get help when it arises. And if you take out the tumor, he's fine. He's a functioning moral citizen. So I'm what's known in the trade as a mushy mixed theorist of punishment. I don't believe you should ever punish people unless they deserve it and no more than they deserve. Okay, and that sets a range in our system from the lowest to the highest. The lowest could be anything from probation to the highest being whatever is the typical sentence in a given jurisdiction for child molestation. And then within that range, you look at things like how much do we have to punish this guy to deter other people? How do we need to incapacitate him because he's going to do it again? And on any rational view of this case, no potential pedophile is going to say, well, maybe I'll get off because I have a tumor. And so therefore, I'm going to go ahead and do it. So deterrence makes no sense. And the guy is not a danger once you get the tumor out. So whatever would be the lowest sentence on the range, that's what I'd give him. And that, by the way, was what the judge did give him the first time. He gave him probation as long as he passed this child molestation yeah. program, which he failed. And then they discovered the tumor, and then he basically gave him probation again. Now, so nowadays, you know, we can go on the internet and, you know, type in, Google in sex offenders near me. I, I think you probably haven't, you know, and you can actually get a map of where convicted sex offenders are. And I wonder if that has actually been any, had any impact on whether or not they repeat offenders. It, it certainly like can help people know to be careful around this person, but. Right. Uh, 
not measurably that we know about. These are known as uh, sex offender registration laws. The Supreme Court has held them constitutional. There are many of us who thought they were not, uh, but that takes us too far afield. Uh, 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 yeah. ba basically because any pedophile now knows that whenever there's a crime like his modus operandi, he's yeah. going to be on the suspect list. Yeah. Yeah. That might help, but I think that's about it. I mean, yeah. who's going to move out of the neighborhood just because this guy moved in? Yeah. And okay, so, and then, I mean, there are, I had a podcast with Ann McKee, she's a neurologist up at Boston University who did all the description of these pro football players with what's called yeah. chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Yeah. And there seem to be a lot of instances where it's very clear these players as this pathology progresses, their their behavior does change. Some of them yes. become more aggressive. I think that who's Hernandez? What that one? Yeah, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Hernandez. Hernandez. Yeah. yeah. Patriots and, player. And and so I would imagine then there and he no, he committed suicide, right? Yeah, finally, yes. Yeah. He committed homicide, then he killed himself. Homicide. But I imagine you know, and it's not just, you know, in talking to her, turns out it's it's not just NFL players, it's college football players and possibly even high school when they Yes. And not only that, maybe other sports. So avoiding <laughs> avoiding head in trauma is uh well, it's a very smart thing to do, but it Yes. Eventually you know, it's unfortunate, but so have there been cases where beyond Hernandez that have come to trial uh, with CTA? Uh, not many. Not uh, many. First thing to notice is that most people who've engaged in these kinds of contact sports that involve potential head trauma don't commit serious crimes. Right. right. All right. So it's a risk factor like yeah. any other. Yeah. And the question is not, do you have risk factors? I mean, my students, my criminal law students are always amazed when I tell them the number one risk factor for crime is genetic. You know, nothing's supposed to be genetic for my students. So they say, what's that? And I say, it's called the Y chromosome. Stay <laughs> yeah. away, stay away from it. Yeah. Right. So. Oh man. Uh, yeah. Every, every war, every war in the world is men. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we would sometimes I think it'd be better just, you know, if our whole government was women. Yeah, you know, except when you look at women leaders, uh they're uh, often, you know, so yeah, you have to be, you have to be careful. In any yeah, any case, look, true. the point simply is look, the law is not concerned with your brain, it's not oh. concerned with your nervous system, it's not concerned with your hormone levels, it's concerned with What's your that? mental states, your behavior, acts and mental states. Yeah, yeah. The criteria for responsibility are acts and mental states. Yeah. So, essentially, even if you've got miserable looking brain on a scan, if you're a rational agent, the way you behave is rationally, yeah. you're a responsible agent. Yeah. By the same token, if you are really an irrational agent, say you are clearly suffering from severe schizophrenia and you have all the positive symptoms, you have delusions, you have hallucinations. I don't care how good your brain looks. You're not a responsible agent. And we've known this forever. Yeah. And where this is playing out today in neural law is adolescent responsibility. Hmm. because in the United States, by and large, 18 is the dividing line. When you're 18, you're treated as an adult for criminal law purposes. Under 18, you're not considered fully responsible, although we have laws that allow certain kinds of heinous juvenile criminals to be treated like adults. But hold that aside. There are now all these people who say, look, we've now learned since the 1990s and diffusion tensor imaging that the brain of adolescence doesn't stop developing at age 18 or 17 and 11 months and 31 days. It keeps going until their middle 20s. And there are two processes especially that are not yet fully mature by late adolescence. And as a result of that, and by the way, the, this 
Rain evidence is really clear. There's very little dispute about that. Yeah. Okay. So now what they're saying is we ought to raise the age of juvenile non-responsibility or lesser responsibility from 18. Some people say 20. Some people say 21. Some people want to go all the way and say 25. And my view is that these brain findings are very, very interesting. They're consistent with developmental psychology that shows all sorts of behavioral changes through the maturation stages of late adolescence and early adulthood, but it doesn't answer our question, which is where should we draw the line for responsibility, which is behavioral. Yeah. So I, I handled a case recently uh, in which the prosecution in this particular case was arguing that the responsibility age should remain at 18. And the Supreme Court of this state was being asked to raise it as a constitutional matter. That's another issue, but okay. So the expert for the defense was arguably the world's leading adolescent development researcher, a really wonderful, wonderful psychologist who's done fabulous research named Larry Steinberg. And so the way they kept cross-examining me, they, the defense, was to say, well, do you have any objection to this work of Dr. Steinberg or that? And I kept saying over and over repetitively, he's the best in the world. Why would I object? He's great. I know the guy very well, by the way. He's great. I have no problem whatsoever with science. Well, why do you disagree with him about the age of responsibility? I said, because it's not a scientific or a psychological question or a neuroscientific question. It's a moral and legal question. Yeah. So, for example, he thinks 16-year-olds should be given the vote. I think they shouldn't be given the vote. Not only that, I'd raise the voting age to 21 if it were up to me. Uh, but that, I'm just not acting as a scientist when I say that. I'm acting as a citizen, and so is he. And so, of course, you know that that was, you know, you were in the 60s uh, when you know you had all the war protests and so on. And so at that time, the the voting age was 21. Right. And. But the draft, the age for getting drafted into the military was 18. Yeah. So you're, you're telling these these young young people that you can't vote to, for the people who are electing to make the decisions on whether to war, go to war or stop the war. But we have to go to war. So I think, you know, that uh, was kind of a. Yeah, it was a, as a political rhetorical move, it was very strong. But I think you can easily draw a principal distinction between those two activities, voting yeah. on the one hand and going to war on the other. And, you know, 18 year olds might not like it, but I think there's yeah. there's no problem with that particular distinction. Yeah. So anyhow, there's all this work going on now uh, on the part of advocates for youth to use the neuroscience to change the law. And one of the few sort of successes, although it's uh, not really a success, was, as you may know, the Supreme Court decided a trilogy of cases having to do with adolescent punishments. And in the first one, they categorically exempted uh, people who committed capital murder below the age of 18. They category ex categorically exempted them from the death penalty. And then in the second case, they categorically exempted kids who committed non-homicide crimes from getting life without the possibility of parole. And in the third case, which was 2012, they said kids who commit homicide crimes can be given life without the possibility of parole, but only after the most searching examination of their responsibility and only in rare cases. All right. So, and in the second and third of these cases, they cited neuroscience studies to support their decision. Now, everyone agreed that there's a difference between adolescents and adults. You didn't need to be a scientist to say there's a difference between adolescents and adults. And people get more mature on average as they get older. And in the first of these three that exempted kids from capital punishment altogether, they cited just social science studies, mostly developmental psychology. And it was good science. By the time the second case came along, that was 2005. By the time the second case came along in 2010, there was no psychological science that would have contradicted 
the psychological science of the first. But they, this time they threw in, huh. at the behest of all the friends of the court briefs, they threw in the neuroscience of development. And it was completely vague. It was nonspecific. And as one now retired Supreme Court justice said to me privately, it was just make weight. They didn't need it. And they didn't. But they cited it. And that just got people all starry eyed. Yeah. So you've mentioned two techniques so far, functional MRI and then DTI, which is diffusion tensor, tension, tensor imaging. And what the DTI is essentially looking at is the white matter, the, the wrapping insulation of the axons. And it, it is pretty clear that uh, the last part of the brain to get this myelination completely in place is the prefrontal cortex. Right. And that, and then there's other data that prefrontal cortex plays critical roles in decision making. So there's kind of a scientific rationale to explain some differences, but as a, as, but so, so then what's that got to do with the law, right? Right. Because you're still, you know, need to find what was the person's intention and what did they do. And how rational an agent were they? That's mm -hmm. the basic response. I mean, when juveniles commit crimes, they have the mental state, the intent or whatever required by the law for guilt. The question is, do they have some sort of mitigating or excusing condition? And the, the most general mitigating or excusing condition generically is lack of rational capacity. And that is what has got to be decided. Now, it's interesting because if you look at 17 and 18, 17 and 16 year olds, a lot of them are going to look a lot like 18, 19 and 20 year olds. And a lot of 18, 19 and 20 year olds are going to look like 16 and 17 year olds, both neurologically and psychologically. So why did the Supreme Court draw a bright line and say under 18, you can't put kids to death who committed capital murder when they were a juvenile. And you could have individuated. You could have said, the court could have said, you, you must do the most careful examination in all cases, but you still can do it. I think they did it as a rule of convenience. Since most kids are going to look less mature on average than most adults, why risk a wrongful execution, a wrongful conviction in capital cases for someone who is more likely than not to be too immature to deserve it. Yeah. So I think, although they could have gone the individuation route, having a categorical rule made a lot of sense in that case. And then people with developmental disabilities too is another issue, I guess. Um, yes. These kinds of things. And they're entitled to an insanity defense too. Uh, people with intellectual disability, what used to be called mental retardation, and then was called developmental disability, and now we call it intellectual disability, uh, categorically cannot be put to death if they commit capital crimes, even if, even if uh, they are criminally responsible. They're simply not responsible enough. And when you look at the Supreme Court case that decided that, which was in the early aughts, uh, Atkins against Virginia, it's called, the reasoning they used for why people with intellectual disability are less responsible was very much like the reasoning they use for why adolescents are less responsible. I mean, it's the same rationality defects. Yeah, yeah. Now, I also did a podcast, and this is a while ago too, with James Blair, who you must have come across. You know, he, he was at National Institute of Mental Health for a while. I was at NIH for 20 years. Then, you know, he did all this work with functional MRI, you know, is and psychopathy. Psychopathy, yes. So maybe you could, you, you know, I've seen previously in, in your writings, you um, say psychopathy is something you are where versus something you have. So we talked about uh, devel de developmental disabilities or some brain injury. That's something you've acquired. Could you talk a little bit about psychopathy from the standpoint of criminal law. I don't know if you want to talk about this now, but yeah, there's this there's this 20 point checklist. Yeah, the can hair talk, psychopathy checklist revised. Can you talk about that? The the hair H A R E 
you know, named after uh, Robert Hare, who's a psychologist at the University of British Columbia. And he's been working on this instrument forever. And the most re the, the revised version, I think, is from the early 1990s, or maybe it's the early aughts. In any case, it's 20 questions that have to do with behaviors and psychological characteristics, uh, whether there are basically two sets of factors or four is a matter of some dispute, but clearly many of the questions are about your behaviors and others are questions about your psychology. And depending if you have a lot of something, you can get a two. If you have none of it, you get a zero. And if you're somewhere in between, you get a one. And so essentially what you can then have, since there are 20 questions, you can rank zero to 40, all right? So as a matter of convention, most psychopathy researchers, and by the way, it's maybe the one of the best measuring instruments in all of psychology. Hmm. I mean, the only thing that comes that's better in my view is the IQ test, which is if you only had to take one test to the desert island, that'd be what you'd take with you. But in any case, uh, so psychopaths are essentially at 30. That's, that's the conventional cutoff. More hmm. than that, you're a psychopath. And less than that, you're not, uh, just in terms of the epidemiology, something like 15 to 25% of maximum security inmates are 30 or higher oh. on the hair. High number. Uh, and by and this what, is what, what percent of the general population would score above 30? Tiny, absolutely tiny. For instance, among you and your colleagues, the average hair score would probably be somewhere between zero and five. Oh. Uh, so, you know, let me if, if you'll indulge me, Stephen. Yeah, I can go pretty quickly through this list just for people. So, number one, glibness and superficial charm, then grandiose sense of self worth, need for stimulation, proneness to boredom, pathological lying, conning, being manipulative, lack of remorse or guilt. That's very important. To me, it is, yes. Yeah, shallow affect. Callous, being callous, you know, not and lacking empathy, parasitic lifestyle, poor behavioral controls, promiscuous sexual behavior, early behavior problems, lack of realistic long-term goals, impulsivity, irresponsibility, failure to accept responsibility for one's own actions, many short-term marital relationships, juvenile delinquency, revoca revocation of conditional release, criminal versatility. Now, I really... You know, there's a particular individual that's been in the news a lot over the last five years, more than anybody else. And when I go through this list, and now now we're at number 20, where it's becoming pretty clear that this person has criminal versatility. <laughs> uh, you know, so, um, but it's hard. It's, talk about, you know, is it easy to identify someone without actually evaluating them and going through, you know, the checklist? I mean, would I be able to, like if in my laboratory or the National Institute of Aging where I was at, there's several hundred people and who I'm around to varying extents over the years, would I be able to kind of say this one is likely to score high on the, maybe so, I don't know. Well, it would depend. I mean, some of these behaviors you'd be able to observe pretty directly. And so what you could at least say yeah. is, yeah. well, so-and-so has a bunch of psychopathic traits, but the question is, would they score 30 on the hair or not? Now, here's the way I look at their responsibility. When you ask yourself, why do you mark obey the law? It's not because you think the cop's going to catch you. Oh, it's, it's because, because my dad was a prosecuting attorney. Ah. <laughs> now that, I, I, quickly, I'll tell you a story about that. I, um, I had a friend. We used to ride dirt bikes. You know, initially, they, this is up in Minnesota. I lived on a farm and I had a, a neighbor a ways away, and there was a highway between us, right? And so we'd go across. You know, he'd come to get to my land. I'd go over to get to his land or ride. And I got stopped by a sheriff. That's when I was like 14 years old. Huh. And he, you know, he, he was a very nice guy. But, you know, I'm a 14-year-old kid, and here's this sheriff or deputy sheriff. 
And he said, no, you can't ride across the highway like that. You have to turn off your motorcycle and walk it across until you get beyond the right of way. And he gave me he gave me a warning ticket. Mm -hmm. Right. And in my mind at that time, I said, oh, no, my dad's going to find about, out about this. You know, every de every deputy sheriff, obviously, in the county knows my dad because he's a, a county attorney and. So, but yeah, it turned out all right. And I've, <laughs> I've respected the law ever since. <laughs> well, my guess is you respected the law even then. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. this is this is pretty minor stuff. I, so I yeah. why do people, why do, why do most people obey the law? They obey the law because they feel guilty. They would feel a sense of remorse. They have the anticipated pang of conscience and and they feel empathetic. How would I like it if someone did that to me and stuff like that? Yep. Uh, my favorite anecdote is my wife dropped two $20 bills on the street of New York City and one not used check yet. And, uh, you know, $40 is not nothing, but it, well, it's 40, we said it's gone. And, you know, we stopped her check and it was gone. Next thing you know, about a week or two later, we get this handwritten, scrawled, really, note. Miss. And it, I can't describe how bad the English was, how bad the writing was. I saw you drop this. I intended to keep it, but my conscience is killing me. I'm sorry for the trouble. And there were the two crisp 20s and the check. Very nice. That's a good <laughs> Oh, I, I, I show it every year in criminal law. So, look. You can be a psychopath. You can get to 30, as it were, without having callousness, lack of remorse, conscience, and the like. But if you get to 35, you're going to have significant defects in that regard. And so what I've argued is these are people who, you know, they know the prices. They know they're going to prison. They know essentially conventionally what is considered right and wrong. They're not out of touch with reality unless they are comorbid with some psychotic level disorder as well. So conventionally, they look responsible. But in my view, they're morally insane. They lack the basic moral tools to guide their conduct, conscience, empathy, remorse, and things like that. And so therefore, I would excuse them. Now, that also is very highly contested in the legal literature. There are some people who agree with me, some people who think it's mitigating but not excusing, and some people who think if they could suffer pain by going to prison and they know the rules and they're in touch with reality, they're fully responsible. A normative question. Even if they're 40 on the hair, it's still a normative question. Yeah, I'm, I've been interested in brain, brain evolution for a while, and these... Uh, you know, I'm just wondering among hunter gatherers, how they, you know, one, are there probably there were individuals with these psychopathic oh, yeah. personality traits, and then how they handled it seemed like, you know, they, it's hard to say what would happen. They could end up either at the top of the thing or being banned from the, tribe or something like that well look free riders and that's what psychopaths are they're free riders free riders. Uh, free riders are a danger to any society and so my guess is they probably killed them hmm. if they could or they were the, they were the top of food chain because so the interesting thing is psychopaths especially if they're intelligent psychopaths can be incredibly successful yeah. they yeah, we know that there are people who are psychopaths in business, in politics. Yeah. And again, especially if you come from a favored background and you can get away with not breaking the law, you can have a very, very successful life without breaking the law and be a psychopath. Yeah, and, and many of those items on that list don't necessarily have anything to do with, you know, Crime. You know, lack of empathy doesn't necessarily have anything to do with breaking the law, and a lot of the that, other ones do. That is exactly right. Um, can you talk a little bit about another issue that comes up in court is um, addictions and and the, the the mental state of you know I briefly mentioned impulsivity, right? And there's certainly you know when I, when I went to college in the seventies. <clears throat> 
the drinking age was 21. So there was, you know, some of the kids on the dorm floor drank, others didn't. And at least one that I remember, when they drank, they got aggressive and violent and impulsive. They they normally, when they weren't drunk, wouldn't, you know, ca cause any trouble. So, you know, is there is 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 committing a crime when you're under the influence any mitigating circumstance? How do you look at that? Well, in American law, the answer is no, at least yeah. not doctrinally, whether a sentencing judge wants to take it into account. Now, remember, all people who are intoxicated when they commit crimes aren't addicts. Some of them are, but many yeah, are not. that's true. That's true. All right. So this is a separate, in a sense, a separate yeah. discussion yeah. from addiction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whether it's mitigating or not is really going to be up to the judge at sentencing. Uh, in Europe, by the way, they're more likely to consider it uh, doctrinally, and that is to get to make sure there is mitigation at the trial level without worrying about sentencing post conviction. Mm -hmm. uh, addiction is not a defense anywhere to crime in the United States. Uh, it does count as the basis for an insanity defense in many European jurisdictions, but mm -hmm. not here. So the question is, what do we do? What do we do about addicts and their responsibility? Now. The first thing, you know, people often think that the behaviors of addicts are like reflexes or like the symptoms of a mechanical disease. So you have a severe enough infection, you spike a fever. That's the, the sign. Uh, if you have a meta metastasizing tumor, the cells migrate. That's a sign, right? Uh, no one thinks you're responsible for your fever or the metastasis. But note that what addiction is defined as is the persistent seeking and using of substances typically with craving and with negative consequences yeah. although those last two craving and negative consequences are not part of the working definition of addiction scientists they are simply persistent seeking and using those are human actions yeah. as human actions they can be judged morally yeah. And so the question is, if I'm an addict, what am I being charged with? If I'm being charged with simple possession, I think that's a very different case from if I do serious crime to afford my habit, like I do armed robbery or even homicide or anything of the sort. Why? First of all, it's a much more, the, the others are much more serious crimes. And to the extent that you have any rationality left, if you're about to commit homicide or armed robbery or a carjacking or anything like that, you have much stronger reason not to do it, despite your addiction, than simple possession for personal use. Yeah. So when I look at all of this, and by the way, I should just tell you, among the three camps of addiction people on responsibility, those who think it's a moral failing, those who think it's an absolute sign that you can't do anything about, and those who think it's a very, in a disease, you know, the NIDA National Institute of Drug Abuse um, agitprop, in my view, is addiction is a chronic and relapsing brain disease, and it matters. Well, I say it's not a chronic and relapsing brain disease, and it matters both ways. Uh, essentially, uh, I'm in the really bad habit camp where these people are responsible. Maybe the responsibility is mitigated. I think our drug-related laws are too harsh. I would mitigate many of them. I would decriminalize possession for personal use alone. Uh, but essentially, let's assume the addict, at the moment of peak craving, commits a crime. I, I've got to commit the crime because I've got to have the stuff. Arguably, at that moment, they're not responsible. Why? The peak craving has made it impossible for thing, them to think of the good reasons not to do it. At that moment, they are so focused on just doing something about the need that they can't think straight. But there are going to be times when they're quiescent. Yeah. And then they know they're going to do it again. So they better get themselves into treatment. They better do whatever they can. It's called diachronous responsibility. If you know you're epileptic and it's not well controlled, you better not drive. 
Yeah. If you drive and let's say then have a seizure and while in the seized state where you're essentially unconscious, you kill somebody with your car, don't tell us you didn't act and you weren't responsible then. You were responsible when you got behind your car. That was the guilty mental state in action. So that's the short form one addiction. Now, my father, who I mentioned, was a prosecuting attorney. He passed away in 2012. He was 90, but he had developed. Oh, good for you. <laughs> he had, de <laughs> he had developed um, dementia over the the preceding probably 10 years, and I, I'm I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. So he was oh, Mayo. Yeah. So I and. I'm in my, I was did a lot of work on Alzheimer's disease through my career at the National Institute on Aging. And so I took him to one of my colleagues, a uh, neurologist there, Ron Peterson, who was this, as an aside, he was Ronald Reagan's doctor. Mm -hmm. We diagnosed him. And so we first noticed it in my father. He's in Minnesota. I'm here in Maryland. And on phone conversations, he would Asked me the same question several times. Classic early sign. It's classic. And but he was still functioning pretty well otherwise. And even even driving a few places to a store to a friend's house. But we took him in and he 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 reached the criteria for probable Alzheimer's disease. So the first thing recommendation that uh Ron Peterson gave us was can you take his car keys away? Mm -hmm. Because now he's diagnosed with probable dementia, right? And then, you know, there's responsibility, at least this is what we felt, responsibility of me and my sister and brother to make sure he doesn't drive. Right. Because, you know, as it progressed, it's going to, now I drive down I-95 here, and sometimes we'll see this silver alert. I don't know if you've seen that silver alert. No, I've never seen that. You've seen like the, what's it for the missing kid one? Amber uh, alert. Amber alert. But now there's a silver alert. It's when there's someone with dementia that is in a car somewhere and didn't come home. Yeah. Yeah. But how how is this again? I guess at trials they if the if someone with and you know I guess the the chances of someone committing a crime go down beyond a certain age. I would think, but forty to forty five. But still, that you know, elderly people do commit crimes and not not many, very few. Yeah. Um, there are some forms of dementia, the behavioral form of Lewy body dementia, uh, where all of a sudden someone who is a perfectly law-abiding, well-controlled person seems to lose it. In fact, every now and then a, a student in my criminal law class will come up to me and say, you know, my uncle Louis, 75 years old, and he just did the damnedest thing. He set a fire or he robbed a bank or whatever, whatever it was. I said, haven't worked up for Lewy body dementia. Uh, but it's very rare. And if they actually went to trial, which would be very, very surprising, most most yeah. DAs would make a deal in this case. Yeah. And if they ever went to trial, they'd raise the insanity defense yeah. and they'd probably win. It's probably similar with frontotemporal dementia. Yes. Like exactly. Bruce Willis, the diehard actor. Right. He has that. But they do have, it affects the frontal cortex a lot and they do have dramatic sometimes personality change yes well you know the very first case quote unquote real was not spider siskoff herbert weinstein it was a uh, a railroad foreman in the middle of the 19th century right who had a tamping iron driven through his frontal cortex and had a major personality change and he lived yeah. and so and then there was the texas tower sniper who had a um you know, Charles Whitman back from about yeah, I 19, remember 1970 shot 30, killed 30 people from sniping from the Texas Tower. And it turned out on an autopsy, he had a tumor pressing very close to his amygdala. Oh, so that the thought was, well, that was what was that's really a worse. fear and anger center of the brain. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. OK, so now let's 
you know, maybe we can finish up by looking into the future. Uh, one thing we really haven't talked about is will technologies uh, be developed that one can tell in a trial with high certainty whether or not someone is telling the truth? Wow. You know, we, we have polygraphs, right? And I guess that's the volunteer, but they're not really too not accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is some extraordinarily promising uh, neuroscience research based on imaging that is testing whether we can get at whether someone's telling the truth or not. Uh, this is largely done by groups on the West Coast at uh, Stanford and UCLA. Mm -hmm. And what they're able to do is distinguish between you know, false memories, as it were, and true memories, as it were, with an amazing degree of, of uh, reliability past chance using scans, uh, multivoxel pixel analysis, whole brain scanning. The problem with that is, of course, that these are research subjects, nothing's at stake. And when they actually taught their students how to beat the scan, uh. then the reliability of the scan went back to chance. And I, as I tell my students, I can teach you how to beat an fMRI in about six seconds. <laughs> and so the, the neuroscientists now say, well, we're then gonna develop a technique that will be able to identify when someone's doing countermeasures at which point there will be countermeasures to the countermeasures and we'll have a, an escalating nuclear arms race. So, <laughs> but at least for subjects who we have no reason to think are lying or manipulating, it might be very helpful in distinguishing between a true memory and not necessarily a lie, but a false memory. Uh, and by the way, the, the research that did this is a psychologist, you would love this, so uh, interestingly, uh, technologically complicated and beautiful. Nice, nice work. Uh, I'll tell you two areas where I'm relatively optimistic. I'm not optimistic about questions of responsibility. I mean, at present, we can't, you know, was John W. Hinckley Jr., the guy who tried to assassinate President Reagan, was he delusional or was he just a narcissistic twit? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was he delusional or not? A major positive symptom of psychotic disorder. We can't tell by a scan whether or not someone's delusional. No. So on responsibility issues, it's not gonna be very helpful, but here are two issues where I am reasonably optimistic for the near future, not tomorrow, but coming. The one you just mentioned, which is false memories. Second, prediction. We have very good behavioral predictive methods now, uh, algorithmic, you know, cookbook, but, we could do better. And the question is, if you add a neural variable to your prediction algorithm, do you increase accuracy? And the answer is on basically four studies now, uh, three in the United States, one in the Netherlands, yeah, slightly. Uh, but at least proof of concept is there. Not ready for prime time, but proof of concept. And the nice thing about that is you don't need to understand the mechanism. You just need enough big data. And if we find that reliably a certain neural region or neural pattern of activity is related to recidivism, we now know it. Now, a lot of civil libertarians worry about that because they think, my God, we're getting too good at that. And I say, look, we've already decided as a society, we're going to use predictions for things like involuntary civil commitment of the mentally disordered, for probation, parole, all sorts of reasons. If we've decided we're going to do it anyhow, it's acceptable. Why not do it better? What's the rational argument for doing it worse? So that's one where I think various uh, legal changes could come in the near future. Although it's still pretty expensive to add in a neural variable. Got to scan somebody. That's expensive. The other is tort law. A fundamental feature of tort law is damages for pain and suffering. We're talking about billions of dollars changing hands every year in the United States. There's no objective measure of pain. As you know, you've been to the doctor. It hurts. Where does it hurt, Mark? And you point. One to ten, ten being the worst, one being the least. How much does it hurt? And you say seven. And is your seven my seven? And how bad is it? How bad is a seven subjectively to you?
uh, if we could get an objective measure of subjective pain, I know that sounds paradoxical, but think about it. If we could get a sub, a, an objective measure of subjective pain, it could revolutionize the tort system in the United States. And there are labs all over the world working on it right now, and they're making progress. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting area. Yeah, um, very much so. I guess ideally, you know, before we started this podcast, I mentioned to you a Brave New World, right? Uh, Aldous Huxley's book where they had developed this drug that everybody took that made them very pleasant and never aggressive and so on. So I guess maybe in the future, but that's like a dystopian thing, right? I mean, right. To me, it's dystopian. Yeah. And, you know, I guess that's one possibility for neuroscience that, but I don't think we necessarily want to go there. Uh, no, I don't think we do. But what worries me is actually part of this prediction equation again. If we stop taking people seriously as responsible agents and we yeah. really develop a very good predictive technology, whether using neuroscience, behavioral science, or some combination, we'd have no reason not to intervene in their lives before they ever do anything uh, yeah. and to manipulate them. I mean, why do we not do that to each other now? Because we think of ourselves as responsible and autonomous agents and the state has got a duty in terms of our liberty and autonomy to leave us alone unless yeah. we offend. Yeah. And that would drop by the wayside. And believe it or not, there are people arguing for that form of social control now. Well, there are some, you know, in, in the UK, London, anyway, they have cameras, you know, every street in the whole city, there's cameras. And my understanding is in China, they have kind of similar thing in the yes. big cities. And uh, apparently, I, I haven't looked at the data, and this is just like secondhand through the news and stuff, but apparently that has reduced crime. Or, well, I'm not or, surprised. or at, least, at least enabled and made it easier to catch the criminal. Yeah, it's a, it's a deterrent. It's a and, deterrent. And that's why it does that. But what I'm talking about is not deterring people. I'm talking about manipulating them yeah. from the get-go so they're not a yeah. threat to each other. Yeah. And, you know, so in other words, if and when uh, you have a bunch of risk factors as a child, the state yeah. gets to intervene and do whatever it takes to make sure and when you do something bad, you're not, we don't say you deserve punishment, you're a responsible age and take responsibility. We just say, well, not your fault. And we'll do whatever we need to do to make sure you don't do it again. But imagine if a family member of yours was killed in this brave new world. And now what the state mm -hmm. says, well, we've done all our, our scanning and tests and this person's never gonna do it again. They're no danger at all. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be happy when they let that guy go? No, no, I don't think so. No, <laughs> no they have to take responsibility. Um, okay, well, this neural law thing has really taken off. I see, you know, I wasn't really following it much at all, but I just, you know, looking around Harvard, where you where you were at way back in the day, they now have a a group. I don't know how big it is, but it looks like it's fairly big group. Yeah, the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. Center for Law, Brain, and I guess that's happening other places as well. Yeah, but although I think I think it's cooling off, Mark, and the reason I think it's cooling off is because, although there's still a lot of enthusiasts out there, where's the beef? Yeah, that's I right. I mean, the neuroscience has just not shown, and what I've noticed, and I think I'm right about this, at least in the United States, although not worldwide, you know, because the rest of the world tries to catch up to us, but they're behind us, is that there are fewer and fewer neuro law articles in the legal literature. And the oh, one, huh. and all the studies that have been done of the use of neuroscience in the criminal law courtroom have shown that it's just confusion. It's a mess. Yeah. And the, the place where it's really mostly used in the United States is at capital punishment proceedings, where the kitchen sink comes in for evidence. The, the standards for admissibility are very, very low. And if you think there's any chance your guy's got a abnormal brain, 
you're going to get them scanned. And there's money to do it for capital punishment because there are so few cases. The notion that we're going to start scanning the vast majority of criminals is cuckoo. It's never going to happen. Well, and even if you scan them, it's not going to really go anywhere. No, no it isn't. That's right. Yeah. Okay, Stephen, I, I enjoyed talking with you. I appreciate it. I enjoyed talking with you as well. I know, know you're busy up there at Penn. And, uh, you know, have a good rest of the year. You too. Take care. All right. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye, Mark.